Chapter 7, Mulch. Time to introduce a new character to our otherworldly pageant. Well, not strictly speaking a new character. We have encountered him before in the LEP booking line. On remand for num numerous larcenies, Mulch Diggums, the kleptomaniac dwarf, a dubious individual even by Artemis Fowl's standards, as if this account didn't already suffer from an overdose of amoral individuals. Born to a difficult, typical dwarf cavern-dwelling family, Mulch had decided early that mining was not for him and resolved to put his talents to another use, namely digging and entering, generally entering mud people's property. Of course, this meant forfeiting his magic. Dwellings were sacred. If you broke that rule, you had to be prepared to accept the consequences. And Mulch didn't mind. He didn't care much for magic anyway. There had never been much use for it down in the mines. Things had gone pretty well for a few centuries, and he built up quite a lucrative above-ground memorabilia business. That was until he tried to sell the Jules Rimet Cup to an undercover LEP operative. From then on, his luck had turned, and he'd been arrested over 20 times to date. A total of 300 years in and out of prison. Mulch had a prodigious appetite for tunneling, and that, unfortunately, is a literal translation. So for those unfamiliar with the mechanics of dwarf tunneling, um, I shall endeavor to explain them as tastefully as possible. Like some members of the reptile family, dwarf males can unhinge their jaws, allowing them to ingest several pounds of earth a second. This material is processed by a super efficient metabolism, stripped of any useful mineral minerals and um, ejected at the other end, as it were. Charming. At present, Mulch was languishing in a stone-walled cell in LEP Central. At least he was trying to project an image, image of languishing, unperturbed, uh, of a languishing, unperturbed kind of dwarf. Actually, he was quaking in his steel-toe-capped boots. The goblin dwarf turf war was flaring up at the moment, and some bright spark LEP elf had seen fit to put him in a cell with a gang of psyched up goblins. An oversight perhaps, more likely a spot of revenge for trying to pick his arresting officer's pocket in the booking line. Sal Dwarf, sneered the head honcho, goblin, a warp faced fellow covered in tattoos. How can you don't chew your way out of here? Mulch wrapped on the wolves. Solid rock! The goblin laughed. So what? Can't be any harder than your dwarf skull. His cronies laughed, and so did Mulch. He thought it might be wise. Wrong. You laughing at me, dwarf? Mulch stopped laughing. With ya, he corrected. I'm laughing with ya. That skull joke was pretty funny. The goblin advanced until his slimy nose was a centimeter from Mulch's own. You patronizing me, dwarf? Mulch swallowed, calculating. If he unhinged now, he could probably swallow the leader before the others reacted. But still, goblins were murder on thy digestion. Very bony. The goblin conjured up a fireball about his fist. I asked you a question, Stumpy. Mulch could feel every sweat gland on his body pop into instant overdrive. Dwarfs did not like fire. They did not even like thinking about flames. Unlike the rest of the fairy races, dwarfs had no desire to live above ground, too close to the sun. Ironic for someone in the mud people possession liberation business. No need for that, he stammered. I was just trying to be friendly. Friendly, scoffed Warface. Your kind don't know the meaning of the word. Cowardly backstabbers, the lot of you. Mulch nodded diplomatically. We have been known to be a bit treacherous. A bit treacherous? A bit treacherous? My brother Flem was ambushed by a crowd of dwarfs disguised as dung heaps. He's still in traction. Mulch nodded sympathetically. Ah, oh, the old dung heap, Bruce. Disgraceful. One of the reasons I don't associate with the Brotherhood. Warp face twirled the fireball between his fingers. 
are two things under this world that I really despise. Mort's had a feeling is about to find out what they were. One is a stinking dwarf. No surprises there. And the other is a traitor to his own kind. And from what I hear, you fall neatly into both categories. Mort smiled weakly. Just my luck. Luck ain't got nothing to do with it. Fortune delivered you into my hands. On another day, Mulch might have pointed out that luck and fortune <laughs> are basically the same thing. Not today. You like fire, dwarf? Mulch shook his head. Wartface grinned. Now ain't that a shame? Because any second now, I'm going to ram this here fireball down your throat. The dwarf swallowed dryly. Wasn't it just typical of the Dwarf Brotherhood? What the dwarves hate? Fire. Who are the only creatures with the ability to conjure fireballs? Goblins. So who did the dwarves pick a fight with? A real no-brainer. Mulch backed up to the wall. Powerful there. We can all go up. Not us. Mort face grinned, snorting the fireball up two elongated nostrils. Completely fireproof. Mulch was perfectly aware of what would happen next. He'd seen it too many times in the back alleys. A group of goblins would corner a stray brother dwarf, pin him down, and then the leader would give him the double barrel straight in the face. Wartface's nostrils quivered as he prepared to vent the inhaled fireball. Mulch quailed. There's only one chance. The goblins had made a, a basic mistake. They'd forgotten to pin his arms. The goblin drew a breath through his mouth, then closed it. More exhalation pressure from the, for the fire stream. He tilted his head back, pointed his nose at the dwarf, and let fly. fly. Quick as a flash, Mulch jammed his thumbs up Lord Face's nostrils. Disgusting, yes, but definitely better than becoming a dwarf kebab. The fire, fireball had nowhere to go. It rebounded on the bowls of Mulch's thumbs and ricocheted back into the goblin's head. The tear ducts provided the path of least resistance, so the flames compressed into pressurized streams erupting just below the goblin's eyes. A sea of flames spread across the cell roof. Mulch withdrew his fingers and after a quick wipe, thrust them in his mouth, allowing the natural balm and saliva to begin the healing process. Of course, if he'd still had his magic, he would, would have just wished the Scorch Digit better. But that was the price he paid for a life of crime. What face didn't look so good? Smoke was leaking from every orifice in his head. Flame-proof fire, flame, flame proof goblins may be, but the errant fireball had given his tubes a good scouring. It swayed like a strap of seaweed, then collapsed face down on the concrete floor. Something crunched. Uh, probably a big goblin nose. The other gang members did not react favorably. Look what he did to the boss! The stinking stomp! Let's fry him! Mort backed up even further. He'd been hoping the remaining goblins would lose their nerve once their leader was out of commission. Apparently not. Even though it was most definitely not in his nature, Mort had no option to attack. Unhinged his jaw and leaped forward, clamping his teeth around the foremost goblin's head. Bog off! He shouted around the obstruction in his mouth. Bog off, or the frog can get it! The others froze, uncertain of the next move. Of course, they'd all seen what dwarf molars could do to a goblin head. Not a pretty sight. Each one popped a fireball in his fist. I'm warning you. You can't get us all, Stumpy. Mulch resisted the impulse to bite down. It is the strongest of dwarf urges, a genetic memory born from millennia spent tunneling. The fact that the goblin was wiggling slimily didn't help. His options were running out. The gang was advancing, and he was powerless as long as his mouth was full. It was crunch time. Oh, pardon the pun. Suddenly, the cell door clanked open, what seemed like an entire squadron of LEP officers flooded the confined space. Mulch felt the cold steel of a gun barrel against his temple. Spit out the prisoner, ordered a voice. 
Most was delighted to comply. A thoroughly sly in the goblin collapsed, wretched on the floor. You goblins, put him out! One by one, the fireballs were extinguished. What's well, not my fault? Lion approached, pointing to the spasming war face. He blew himself up. The officer altered his weapon, dropping, drawn out a set of cuffs. I couldn't care less what you do to each other, he said, but then mulch and snapping the cuffs on. If it was up to me, I'd put the whole lot of you in a big room and come back a week later to sluice it out. But Commander Root wants to see you above ground ASAP. ASAP? Now, if not sooner. Mulch knew Root. The commander was responsible for several of his government hotel visits. If Julius wanted to see him, it probably wasn't for drinks and a movie. No? Well, it's daylight now. I'll burn. The LP officer laughed. It ain't daylight where you're going, pal. Where you're going, it ain't anything. Root was waiting for the dwarf inside the time field portal. The portal was not yet another of Foley's invention. Fairies could be introduced to and leave the time field without affecting the altered flow inside the field. This effectively meant that even though it took nearly six hours to get mulch to the surface, he was injected into the field only moments after Root had the notion to send for him. It was Mulch's first time in a field. He stood watching life proceed at an exaggerated rate outside the shimmering corona. Cars zipped by at impossible speeds, and clouds tumbled across the skyline as though driven by force ten gales. Mulch, your rubber break! roared Root. You can take off that suit now! The field is UV filtered, or so I'm told. The dwarf had been issued a blackout suit that he won. Even though the dwarfs had thick skins, they were extremely sensitive to sunlight and had a burn time of less than three minutes. Mulch peeled off the skin tight suit. Nice to see you, Julius. That's Commander Root to you. Oh, Commander, no. I heard of that. Clerical error, wasn't it? Root's teeth ground his cigar to a pulp. I don't have time for this impudence, convict. The only reason that my boot is not up here behind right now is that I have a job for you. Mulch frowned. Convict? I have a name, you know, Julius. Root squatted to the dwarf's level. I don't know what dream world you live in, convict, but in the real world you are a criminal, and it is my job to ensure your life is as unpleasant as possible. So if you're expecting civility just because I've testified against you some 15 times, forget it. Waltz rubbed his wrists where the handcuffs had left red wilts. Point commander, you don't need to blow your basket. I'm not a murderer, you know, just a petty criminal. From what I hear, you nearly made the transformation blow in the cells. Not my fault. They attacked me. Root screwed a fresh cigar into his mouth. Fine, whatever. Now follow me and don't steal anything. Yes, sir, Commander, said Mulch, innocently. He didn't need to steal anything else. He had already palmed Root's field access card when the Commander had made the mistake of leaning over. They crossed the retrieval perimeter to the avenue. You see that matter? What matter? Root rounded on him. I don't have time for this, convict. Nearly half my time stop has elapsed. In a few hours, one of my best officers will be blue rinsed. Mulch shrugged. None of my concern. I'm just a criminal, remember. And by the time, by the way, I know what you want me to do, and the answer is no. I haven't even asked you yet. It's obvious. I'm a housebreaker. That's a house. You can't go in because you'll lose your magic. But well, my magic is already gone. Two and two. Root spat out the cigar. Don't you have any civic pride? Our entire way of life is on the line here. Not my way of life. Very prison, human prison. All the same to me. Commander thought about it. Okay, you slime. Fifty years off your sentence. I want amnesty. In your dreams, Mulch. Take it or leave it. Seventy-five years and minimum security. You take it or leave it. Mulch pretended to think. His all academic scene as he intended to escape anyway. Single cell? Yes, yes, single cell. Now, will you do it? Very well, Julius. Only because it's you. Foley was searching for a matching iris. 
There's all I think, or perhaps Tony. You really do have stunning eyes, Mr. Mulch. And I ain't Gaboli. My mother always said they're most, my, my most attractive feature. Root was pacing the shuttle door, my shuttle floor. You do do realize we're on a deadline here, don't you? Never mind matching a color, just give a camera. Only plucked the lens from its solution with tweezers. This is not this is not just vanity, Commander. The closer the match, the less interference from the actual eye. Whatever, whatever, just get on with it. Holy grabbed Mulch's chin, holding him still. There you are. We're with you all the way. Holy twisted a tiny cylinder into the thick tufts of hair growing from Mulch's ear. Wire for sound now, too, in case you need a call for assistance. The dwarf smiled wryly. Forgive me for not sounding and smelling with confidence. I found I've always done better on my own. If you call 17 convictions doing better, chuckled Root. Oh, we have time for jokes now, do we? Root grabbed him by the foot shoulder. You're right. We know. Let's go. He dragged Bulch across the grassy verge to, the cluster, to a cluster of cherry trees. I want you to tunnel in there. Find out how this foul person knows so much about us. Probably some surveillance device. Whatever it is, destroy it. Find Captain Short if possible and see what you can do for her. If she's dead, at least will be clear of the way for a bio bomb. Mulch squint, squinted across the landscape. I don't like it. Why don't you like? A lie of the land, a small limestone, solid rock foundation, there might not be a way in. Holy trotted across. I've done a scan. The original structure is based totally on rock, but some of the later extensions stray onto clay. The wine cellar in the south wing appears to have its wooden floor. Should be no problem with some of a mouth like yours. Most decided to take that as a statement of fact rather than an insult. He opened the back flap of his tunneling pants. Right, stand back. Root and the surrounding LEP officers rushed for cover. But Foley, who had never actually seen a dwarf tunneling, decided to stay for a peek. The luck mulch, the dwarf unhinged his jaw. Ankle, he mumbled, then an over for lunch. The centaur looked around. Where's everyone? He never finished that statement, because a blob of recently swallowed and even more recently recycled limestone whacked him in the face. By the time he cleared his eyes, Mulch had disappeared down a vibrating hole, and there was a sound of hearty laughter shaking the cherry trees. Mulch followed a loomy vein through a volcanic hole in the rock. Nice consistency, not too many loose stones. Plenty of insect life, too. Vital for a strong, healthy teeth. A dwarf's most important attribute. The first thing a prospective mate looked at. Mulch went low to the limestone, his belly almost scraping the rock. The deeper the tunnel, the last chance of substance on the surface. You couldn't be too careful these days, not with motion sensors and landmines. Mud people went to extraordinary lengths to protect their valuables, with good reason as it happened. Mulch fell a vibration cluster to his left. Rabbits. The door fixed the location as an internal in his internal compass. Always useful to know where the local wildlife hung out. He skirted the warren, following the metal foundations around a long northwesterly loop. Wine cellars were easy to locate. Over the centuries, residue seeped through the floor, infusing the land beneath the wine's personality. Beneath was the wine's personality. This one was somber, nothing there and there. A touch of fruit, but not enough to open the flavor. Definitely a cajun wine on the bottom rack. Mulch burped. That was good clay. The dwarf aimed his scything jaws skyward, punching through the floorboards. He hauled himself through the ragged hole, shaking the last of the recycled mud from his pants. He was in a blessedly dark room, perfect for dwarf vision. His sonar had guided him to an uncovered spot in the floor. Three feet to the left, he would have emerged in a huge barrel of Italian red. Bolts rehinged his jaw and padded across to the wall. He flattened a conch-like ear to the red brickwork. For a moment, he was absolutely still, absorbing the house's vibrations. A lot of low-frequency oven. There was a generator somewhere and plenty of juice running through the wires. Footstep two, way up, maybe on the third floor. 
Then close by, crashing sound. Metal on concrete. Ah, there it was again. Someone was building something or breaking something down. Something skidded past his foot. Smoke squashed instinctively. Oh, it was a spider. Ah, oh, just a spider. Sorry, little friend, he said to the grey smear. I'm a bit on the jittery side. Steps were wooden, of course, more than a century old too by the smell of them. Steps like that creaked as soon as you looked at them, better than any pressure pads for giving away intruders. Moat climbed along the edges, one foot in front of the other. Right in by the wall was where the wood had the most support and was less likely to creak. This is not as simple as it sounds. Dwarf feet are designed for spade work, not for the delicate intricacies of ballet dancing or balancing on wooden steps. Nonetheless, Moat reached the door without incident. A couple of minor squeaks, but nothing that would be detectable by human ears or hardware. The door was locked naturally, but it may as well not have been for all the challenge it presented to the kleptomaniac dwarf. Volt reached into his beard, plucking out a sturdy air. Dwarf air is radically different from the human variety. Volt's beard and head air were actually a matrix of antenna that helped him to navigate and avoid danger below ground. Once removed from its pore, the air immediately stiffened in rapid rigor mortis. Mulch twitched, twitched the end in the seconds before it became completely rigid, a perfect pick. One quick jiggle and the lock yielded. Only two tumblers, terrible security. Typical of humans, they never expect an attack from below. Mulch stepped onto a parquet floor. The whole place smelled of money. He could make a fortune here, if only he had the time. There were cameras just below the arch trail. Tastefully done, nestling in the natural shadows, but vigilant nonetheless. Walt stood for a moment, calculating the system's blind spots. Three cameras on the corridor, 90 second sweep, no way through. You could ask for help, said a voice in his ear. Holy? Mulch pointed his wired eyeball at the nearest camera. Can you do anything about those? He whispered. The dwarf heard the sound of a keyboard being manipulated, and suddenly his right eye zoomed like a hot camera lens. Andy, breathed Mulch. I've got to get me one of these. Root's voice crackled through the tiny speaker. No chance, convict. Government issue. Anyway, what would you do with one in prison? Get close up on the other side of your cell? You're such a charmer, Julius. What's the matter? Are you jealous because I'm succeeding where you failed? Rude's foul swearing was drowned out by Foley. Okay, I've got it. Simple video network, not even digital. I'm going to broadcast a loop of the last 10 seconds to every camera through our dishes. That should give you a few minutes. Rude shuffled uncomfortably. How long will that take? I'm a bit exposed here, you know. Before you started, said Foley. So get moving. Please mute your stuff. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. Elementary electronics. I've been messing with human surveillance since kindergarten. You just have to trust me. Rather than trust a bunch of humans not to hunt a species of extinction than trust an LEP a consultant, thought Mulch. But aloud, he said, Okay, I'm away, I'm away, over and out. He sneaked down the hall, even as hands were sneaky, patting the air as if he could somehow make himself lighter. Whatever that centaur did must have worked because there was no agitated mud, mud people racing down the stairs waving primitive gunpowder weapons. Stairs. Ah, oh, stairs. Mulch had a thing for stairs. They're like pre-dug shafts. He found that inevitably the best booty lay at their summit. And what to stare away? Stained oak with the intricate carvings generally associated with either the 18th century or the obscenely rich. Mulch rubbed his finger along an ornate banister. In this case, probably both. Still, no time to move about. Stairways did not tend to remain deserted for long, especially during a siege. Who could tell how many bloodthirsty troopers waited behind each door, eager for a fairy head to add to their stuffed trophy wall? Mulch climbed carefully, taking nothing for granted. 
even solid oak creek. They stuck to the borders, avoiding the carpet inlay. The dwarf knew from conviction number eight how easy it was to conceal a pressure pad beneath the deep shag of some antique weed. He reached the landing with his head still attached to his shoulders, but there was another problem quite literally brewing. Um, dwarf digestion, due to its accelerated rate, can be quite explosive. The loosely packed soil on the foul estate was very well aerated, and a lot of that air had entered Mulch's tubes, along with the soil and mineral. Now the air wanted to get out. Uh, dwarf etiquette dictated that gas be passed while still in the tunnel, but Mulch didn't have time for manners. Now he regretted not taking a moment to get rid of the gas while he was in the cellar. The problem with dwarf gas was that large de deposits couldn't go up, only down. Imagine, if you will, the catastrophic effects of burping while digesting a mouthful of clay. Total system backup, not a pretty sight. Thus, dwarf anatomy ensured that anything above the level of a soil burp passed below, actually aiming in the expulsion of unwanted clay. Wolf wrapped his arms around his stomach. He'd better get out of the open. A blowout and a land like this could take out the windows. He shuffled along the corridor, skipping toward the first doorway he encountered. More cameras, quite a lot of them, in fact. Mulch studied the lenses sweep. Four were surveying the general floor space, one of the three were fixed. Holy, you there? whispered the dwarf. No, the typical sarcastic reply. I have much better things to do than worry about the collapse of civilization as we know it. Yes, thank you. Don't let my life being in danger interrupt your merriment. I'll try not to. I have a challenge for you. Holy was instantly interested. Really? Go on. Mulch pointed his gaze at the recessed cameras, half hidden in the swirling architrave. I need to know where those three cameras are pointing. Exactly. Holy laughed. That's not a challenge. This, those old system video systems emit faint ion beams, invisible to the naked eye, of course, but not with your iris scan. The odd wear in Mulch's eyes flickered and sparked. Ow! Sorry, small charge. You could have warned me. I'll give you a big kiss later, you baby. That dwarf's tough. We are tough. I'll show you just how tough when I get back. Ruth's voice interrupted the posture. You won't be showing anything, anyone, anything, convict, except perhaps where the toilet is in your cell. Now, what do you see? Mulch looked at the room again through his ion sensitive eye. Each camera was emitting a faint beam like the last evening sun rays. The rays pooled on a portrait of Alturus Fowl Sr. Oh, not behind the picture. Oh, please. Mulch placed his ear against the picture glass. Not electrical, not alarm then, just to be sure, sure he sniffed the frame's edge. No plastic or copper, wood, steel and glass, some lead in the paint. He curled the nail behind the frame and pulled. The picture came away smoothly, hinged on the side, and behind it, a safe. It's a safe, said Foley. I know that, you idiot. I'm trying to concentrate here. If you want to help, tell me the combination. No problem. Oh, by the way, there's another little shot coming. Maybe the big baby would like to suck his thumb for comfort. Holy! Holy, I'm going to... Ow! There. That's the X-ray on. Mulch well, squinted at the safe. It was incredible. He could see right into the works. Tumblers and catches stood out in shadowy relief. He blew on his airy fingers and twisted the combination dial. In seconds, the safe lay open before him. Ow! Oh said disappointed what is it nothing just human currency nothing of value leave it ordered root try another room get going mulch nodded another room before his time ran out but something was niggling at him if this guy was so clever why did he put the safe behind a painting such a cliche totally against form no there's something wasn't right here they're being duped somehow Mulch closed the safe, swinging the picture back into position. It swung smoothly, weightless on the hinges. 
wait list. They swung the picture out again and back in. Conrad, what are you doing? Total Julius, I mean, wait a moment, Commander. Moat squinted at the frame's profile. A bit thicker than normal, quite a bit thicker. He even takes the bo- taking the box frame into account. Two inches. He ran a nail down the heavy cartridge back and then stripped it away to reveal another safe. A smaller one. Custom made, obviously. Oh, I can't, I can't see you through this. Let mind. You're on your own, burglar boy. Do what you do best. Take a cold, muttered Molt, flattening his ear to the cold steel. He twirled the dial experimentally. Nice action. The clicks were muted by the lead. You'd have to concentrate. The upside was that something this thin could only have three tumblers at the most. Bolch held his breath and twisted the dial one cog at a time. To the normal ear, even with amplification, amplification that picks would have seemed uniform. But to Mulch, each cog had a distinctive signature, and when a ratchet caught, it was so loud as to be deafening. One, he breathed. Hurry up, convict, your time is running out. He interrupted me to tell me that. I can see now how you made Commander Julius. Convict, I got it. But there's no use. Mulch had removed his earpiece, earpiece, slipping into his pocket. Now he could devote his full attention to the task at hand. Two, there was noise outside in the hall. Someone was coming, about the size of an elephant by the sound of it. No doubt this was the man mountain that had made mincemeat of the retrieval squad. Bolch blinked a bead of sweat from his eye. Concentrate, concentrate. The cogs clicked by. Millimeter millimeter by millimeter. Nothing was catching. The floor seemed to be upping gently, though he couldn't be imagining it. Click, click. Come on, come on. His fingers were slick with perspiration. The dials slipping between them. Mulch wiped them on his jerkin. Now, baby. Come on, talk to me. Click, thunk. Yes. Mulch twisted the handle. Nothing. Still an obstruction. He ran a finger trip over the metal face. There, a small irregularity. A micro keyhole. Too small for your average lockpick. Time for a little trip he learned in prison. Quickly, though, his stomach was bubbling like stew in the oven, and the footsteps were getting closer. Selecting a sturdy chin air, Mulch fed it gently into the tiny hole. When the tip reappeared, he pulled the root from his chin. The air immediately stiffened, retaining the shape of the lock's interior. Mulch held his breath and twisted. Smooth as a goblin's lie, the lock opened. Beautiful. A moments like those, it was almost worth all the jail time. The kleptomaniac dwarf swung back the little door. Beautiful work. work. Almost worthy of a fairy forge, light as a wafer. Inside was a small chamber, and in the chamber was... Oh, no, breathed Mulch. Then things came to an end rather rapidly. The shock that Mulch had experienced communicated itself to his bowels, and they decided the excess air had to go. Mulch knew the symptoms. Jelly legs, bubbling cramps, wobbly behind. In the seconds remaining to him, he snatched the object from the safe, and leaning over, he clasped his knees for support. The constrained wind had built itself up to many cyclone intensity, and it could not be constrained. So it exited, rather abrasively, blowing open Mulch's back flap and slamming into the rather large gentleman who had been sneaking up behind him. Artemis was glued to the monitors. This was the time when things traditionally went wrong for kidnappers, the third quarter of operations. Having been successful thus far, the abductors tended to relax, light up a few cigarettes, get chatty with their hostages. Next thing they knew, they were flat on their backs with a dozen guns pointed at the backs of their heads. Not to Artemis Fowl. He didn't make mistakes. No doubt the theories were reviewing the tapes of their first negotiation session, searching for anything that would get them, give them a way in. Well, it was there, all right. All they had to do was look. Very just deep enough to make it look accidental. It was possible that Commander Root would try another ruse. He was a wily one, no doubt about it. One who would not take kindly to be invested by a child. 
He would bear watching. The mere thought of Root gave Artemis the shivers. He decided to check in again. He inspected the monitors. Juliet was still in the kitchen, scrubbing up the sink, washing the vegetables. Captain Short was on her bunk, quiet as the grave. No more at bed banging. Perhaps he had been wrong about her. Perhaps there was no plan. Butler stood at his post outside Holly's cell. Odd. He should have been on his rounds by now. Artemis grabbed a walkie-talkie. Butler. Roger Base. Receive, receiving. Shouldn't you be on your rounds? There was a pause. I am Artemis, patrolling the main landing, coming up on the safe room. I'm waving at you right now. Artemis glanced at the landing cameras. Deserted. From every angle. Definitely no waving manservant. He studied the monitors, counting under his breath. There. Every ten seconds, a slight jump on every screen. A loop, he cried, jumping from his chair. They're feeding us a loop. Over the speaker, you could hear Butler's pace quick into a run. The safe room. Artemis' stomach dropped into queasy he held. Duped. He, Artemis Fell, had been duped, even though he'd known it was coming. Inconceivable. It was arrogance that had done it, his own blinding arrogance, and now the entire plan could collapse around his ears. He switched the walkie-talkie to Juliet's band. It was a pity now that he'd taken the house's intercom offline, but it didn't operate on a secure fre frequency. Juliet, proceeding. Where are you right now? In the kitchen, working my nails on this grater. Will you, Juliet, check on the prisoner? I guess the carrot stick will dry out. Leave it, Juliet. Shout to Artemis. Drop everything and check on the prisoner. Juliet obediently dropped everything, including the walkie-talkie. It's up for days now. Never mind. There's no time to worry about a teenage girl's bruised ego. Get more important matters to tend to. Artemis depressed the master switch on the computerized surveillance system. His only chance of purging the loop was a complete reboot. After several agonizing moments of screen snow, the monitor monitors jumped and settled. Things were not as they had seemed only seconds before. There was a grotesque thing in the safe room. It had apparently discovered the secret compartment. Not only that, but it had managed to open the whisper lock. Amazing. Butler had it covered, though. He was sneaking up behind the creature, and any moment now the intruder would find itself nose down in the carpet. Artemis switched his attention to Oli. The elf was back to bed banging, slamming the frame down over again as though she could hit Artemis then like a blast from a water cannon. If Holly had somehow smuggled an acorn in there, then one quarter centimeter of ground wouldn't be enough. Would be enough. If Juliet left that door open, Juliet, he shouted into the walkie-talkie, Juliet, don't go in there. But it was useless. The girl's walkie-talkie lay buzzing on the kitchen floor. And Artemis could only watch helplessly as Butler's sister strode toward the cell door, muttering about Karen. Okay, we are going to stop there.